repetitive behaviour. It provides comfort, pleasure and emotional release from endlessly picking at often healthy skin. It can often lead to bleeding, infection, scarring and physical deformities, as well as significant emotional and mental distress. So, I'm going to start at the beginning. I didn't intend to be standing in UCLA talking to you about the most personal, private experience of my life. This was not in my game plan at all. Um, I studied theatre um, initially, so about 12 years ago I did a degree in theatre. And then 10 years ago I did a master's in dance. And um, in the first few days of the course, we were instructed to take a video camera, go into a studio and record how our bodies naturally move. Look at the natural choreography of your body. If you're going to train and you're going to choreograph other people and you want to do dance, you need to understand how your own body moves. So I took the camera, I went into a dance studio and I can't describe the terror that I felt. Because I knew under my clothes I was an absolute tapestry, a canvas of marks and scars, and this compulsive disorder had been with me since I was a child. I grew up in a really turbulent home. My mum was a chronic alcoholic when I was a child. Um, when I was about eight years old, she went into recovery, and in fact, her AA birthday was yesterday, and she's been 30 years sober. <laughs> she'll be very pleased that <laughs> she's not here, but she'll, she'll see this later. So to be here now, 30 years after those really frightening experiences, this journey for me is so much bigger than just coming to Los Angeles. This is a journey of recovery that has taken decades. And it's not easy for me to stand here and tell you the truth about my experience. So yeah, let's go back to that dance studio. I filmed myself in the afternoon and I knew if I filmed my body for five minutes, 10 minutes, 20 minutes, an hour, I will see this illness. My hands will creep up to my face. My hands will creep down my t-shirt. My hands creep up the back of my t-shirt. I pick the soles of my feet and I recorded it. And I played the film back and it was the first time I'd seen what this illness was doing to my body, what I was doing to my body. And it was absolutely terrifying. I never had treatment for it. I'd never told a soul, only partners I was going out with. An occasional doctor would say, what are those marks? And I'd lie and I'd say, oh, nothing. I'd, you know, I just picked a spot, I picked a scab. I never, ever told people the truth. And my whole life, right up until 10 years ago, was a whole series of camouflaging it, covering it with makeup, wearing clothing that didn't reveal my skin. The fact that I'm even wearing a, a short sleeve t-shirt now is unbelievable. Unbelievable. So my body was completely marked all the time. I would bleed through my clothes, I would bleed in public because I'd pick something on a train, I'd pick something in a class and it would bleed. I would pick in my sleep, so I would wake up and there'd be blood on the pillow and my body would have been habitually doing this illness all through my sleep. It was compulsive, repetitive, really damaging, really shameful, really shameful. And I really struggled because the other side of my life was theatre and performance and loving expressing. I, you know, I'm fascinated by the body, so I'm in this terrible dichotomy. You know, on the one hand, it's all about expression and being unique and celebrating and getting up on a stage and people look at you. On the other hand, I'm wearing long sleeve tops, I'm wearing roll necks, I'm covering my face with makeup. I don't want anyone to know the truth that underneath it, I'm this damaged, marked human being. I don't look like other people. I don't feel like other people. So this is the first thing that happened. That, that series of films that um, I did in the, in the dance studio turned into a two year project. And I made the decision really quickly. I had this awful weekend where I thought, what the hell have I done? I've signed up for a masters in dance. I've paid all this money and they've asked me to go and film my body the first week. And I was not expecting that. I want to choreograph other people. I don't want to look at me. But no, it actually turned out to be the best thing that could have happened. So I started filming what this illness looked like, what it felt like, how it functioned. When I would pick, I would take photographs. The first time in my life I started turning the camera around and taking pictures of what this illness looked like. To start with, I didn't show my peers, I didn't explain to anyone on my course, it was a, a, a secret with my tutors that this is what I was doing. 
I didn't know where I was going. You know, I hadn't signed up to do art therapy. You know, I'd never had therapy. But the most therapeutic, transformative journey began. So this uh, is an image from a series of photographs that I took over two years. There's about 18,000 photographs in this series and I filled a room. And for me, that was the sense of this compulsion being really visible. This is what I feel like every day. From the minute I wake up, before I wake up, my mind is in this place, my fingers are in this place. And the images are very raw and I didn't edit them and I'm not interested in photoshopping and transforming them. And everything you see here, none of it is photoshopped. It's not about correcting or changing the image. And I didn't have a camera at the time. Those images came from using my phone. I haven't trained as a photographer. I'm not interested in being a technical, brilliant photographer. I used a scanner. This is a scanner that my mum had bought me to do my coursework on. And I thought of the joke of people putting their bums on photocopy as a password. <laughs> <laughs> to be honest. Uh, and as you can see, I have a scar on my face right here. And I'd started scanning my face, and it was a bit of a joke to start with. I was like, well, this thing picks up, you know, it takes a 15, 15 seconds for a scanner to move across the glass and take an image. So I started thinking of them as, of them as performances. And very slowly they became performative. So this illness feels fractured, it feels juddery, it feels twitchy. And I tried to think, if I was going to change this illness into something visual, what would it look like? And very slowly these images started to appear. So this is using a face mask that I was using repeatedly to try and clear up my skin looking on my face. But of course as it dries and cracks and peels, it actually feels like what the illness is on the inside. This is using um, acrylic paint and moving at the same time that the scanner moves. So my dance background is starting to be included in how these images are captured. Again, clay face mask, so there's this thick, luscious kind of material on my face because my face felt bigger than it actually is. The sort of body dysmorphia that I live with is, makes my body feel different to what it actually is. This is milk. Everyone was getting worried by this point I was going to electrocute myself. So this actually won an award in London for a self-portrait competition. Um, and you know, I stopped seeing me in these images. I started seeing what this illness feels like and I started to use them like a diary. So over the course of two years I took about um, eight and a half thousand images of these scans. So there's many, many, many repetitions of the same process, the same feeling, the same physical action. Absolutely mirrors what this illness does for me. Again, this is milk. And you'll notice these images are in the dark. So I took pictures at the times when the illness was most challenging. At night, getting undressed, that was always the time where I'd be near a mirror, I'd probably pick. And picking for me was not, I'll squeeze a few spots and then I'll go to bed. I'd lose seven hours at the mirror, maybe more. I'd only start to realise how long I'd been picking by whether parts of my body had gone to sleep, because if I was sitting on the side of the sink and I was picking looking back into a mirror, I only would realise I'd been there too long because the blood stops moving in my legs. So it gives you an idea of how prevalent this illness was, how compulsive. And every night would be like that for many years. So actually taking an image and repeatedly taking images at the absolute points when this illness was functioning was so valuable and so transformative. Sense of compulsion, repetition, repeating, repeating, repeating. It's what this illness does. So what happens if it's a visual act instead? I realised that the light could be transformed in the room, so if I'm switching a, a bedside light on next to the scanner, it fractures the image even more. And this is starting to express what I really felt like. I felt fractured all the time. And moving at the same time as the scanner meant the face deforms. It shifts, it breaks up. Dance is a massive thing in how I've come to terms with this illness. I've understood this illness from the inside out. I've followed how my body moves and I've turned those movements into something else. So for me, working with a camera is a really valuable thing. When the illness was really bad, I'd use my fingers and my fingernails to pick. 
What I've done is put the camera in my hand so that my fingers are really, they're doing the same action, but they're taking a photograph every time. I don't work with a camera with a big lens, I work with a small handheld camera, so it gives that sense of intimacy, but it also gives me a sense of control, and it's replacing the mirror. Every time I'm taking a photograph, the reason I'm in these images and the reason they are this reflective experience is that's what the illness feels like. I did a residency here um, in 2008, and it was a dance residency. So I'm still kind of in the world of dance from my masters in that respect. And I turned up and all the dancers are kind of perfect body, perfect skin, beautiful creatures. And I was like, I've got a scabby back and a scabby face. And okay, so we're going into a studio for six hours at a time. What happens with that? And it's the same process. And I feel like in 10 years, I'm still doing that. I'm still sitting with the illness and working with it not working against it, working with it. So these images were starting to apply things to the face to actually make that feeling much more visceral. So this is acrylic paint and um, soil. I buried myself one afternoon just to get this sense of something completely over my body. So body dysmorphia and the sense of physicality in my artwork is absolutely in there. The two things are still having a conversation. I did a residency in Japan this was a remarkable part of my journey of recovery. Um, four years ago now, I was there for, um, for uh, four weeks, and it was an isolated center in the south of Japan, and there were lots of insects. I was absolutely terrified <laughs> by the insects. But once again, this illness feels like insects on my body. It feels like there are things crawling across me that I either scratch, or I need to pick, or I need to squeeze out. So what happens if I make artwork directly with insects? So these are cicadas, um, you probably have them in California. In London, we don't have cicadas. <laughs> they're like this long, they look like a bug with great big, yeah, they're really scary. Isn't they? <laughs> so they're dead, and I worked with the male wings and female wings, and trying to make something that is transformative, that's what this work continues to be about for me. Textures. I am obsessed with textures. You're lucky I'm not out there right now looking for a cracked surface to take out I might have actually just been. <laughs> <laughs> I've been taking photographs of textures for a long time. And again, on my phone, none of this is a technical, amazingly skilled thing. Um, textures that are cracked, peeling paint, damaged, distressed, aged, rocks that have funny nooks and crannies. This is something that's been in my visual language for a long time. And I suddenly realized actually the compulsion, the repetition, the repeatedly capturing things is all here again. So again, it's not walking away from those things being a fascination, not thinking well, that's a bit weird that you're into rocks and stuff. Yeah, I am. And there's millions of these images on my hard drive. They're absolutely feeding how I function and how I process that sense of texture. The tactile sense of the body is in these images. So this is a macro photograph of um, the back of my hand. This sense of things being pulled out, stretched, coming out of the skin. I wanted something that started to capture what this image, what this um, illness feels like as it starts to transform. And the pores, the detail of the skin completely fascinates me. And instead of thinking this is something wrong or this is something weird, I started really celebrating it. So these are casts of my, my chest. So I took um, a cast with latex and then shone light through it. So it really celebrates this kind of glowing quality of the skin. You know, this organ is remarkable. No matter what I've done to my body, it has constantly healed, it's, it's recovered. You know, I carry scars where the body has prepared me to carry on with my life. You know, this tapestry of scars will always be with me, but they're valuable. They're really valuable to me now, and I'm not afraid to say I have them. You know, I'm standing up here today, that's a, a massive deal. <laughs> So, um, and I think as well, understanding that the skin is constantly knitting and, and rejigging the, the body and preparing you for future things. We carry our skins with us for the whole of our lives. They are this tapestry of experiences, people we've met, people we've loved, experiences we've had, places we've been. Our skin is the first thing that feels everything. So when you've got something wrong with your body, and it's that part of your body that you're constantly battling with, for me, coming to terms with my skin and really thinking this is a beautiful, amazing organ, 
I respect it more than anything, and that's why I'm able to talk to you in the way I'm talking now. So it continues. I started working in a much more painterly way with the body. Um, these images are much more recent. There's this celebratory quality. This is part of the body I was so afraid of, so ashamed of. No one was going to see it. You know, I wore clothes for 20 years that hid this part of the body. So what happens if it's my canvas? What happens if this is the part I make the artwork with? From, to. So this is important. The feeling of my face, this is something that I struggle with even to this day, and I, I'm not ashamed to say that that, that that will probably always be with me. My face was the primary place of picking. So to make artwork directly onto it, with it, from it, again, this is something about the texture, the transformation, the quality of this body carrying something else. So instead of seeing my skin as, as I see it, I wanted to create something very transformed. And there's another image of um, the sort of painterly stuff I've been doing. And this lavish quality of art, I mean, it's fantastic. I, can, I now make messy art, and it's the most joyful thing ever. This is really runny liquid paint on my hands. My hands have been this horrendous tool. You know, you think your hands are so valuable for everything you do, but if they are part of something that is destroying you, and you carry them with you everywhere, what, what happens with those? How can I rethink them? And part of it was celebrating them. They're valuable. So I wanted something that's really visual and really powerful. This part of my body, again, I come back to time and time again. I think of it in a very fragile way. You know, our collarbones and our, our heart is in there, and it's all, you know, it's a very emotional place, it's a very tender place, it's a very private place. So if this is the place I've attacked, how can I express it in a different way? I do think of it as being bruised. It's a place I've constantly attacked. So there is this quality that feels like a bruise. But for me, you know, I'm not damaging my body by making this artwork. I'm transforming my body for making this artwork. And it's a reflection of the internal and the external all happening in the same moment. Working with other artists, when I try to describe some of the ways I feel inside and how I imagine something happening, it's really hard to think, how can I do, how can I turn that into an image? And I've started trusting other people and being able to work with others and collaborate with other artists. So this is a, a collaboration with a performance photographer called Manuel Vasson, who photographs a lot of performance artists. His work is very visceral, it's often quite raw. I just said to him, I feel like this illness is, my skin is being pulled off most of the time. And he said, that's a really interesting thing to say. So we were trying to kind of work out how to create something that looks visually like it feels. So this is working with eight people. That is a massive deal. Eight people are close, in close proximity to me, pulling my skin on. So this is latex, obviously. But um, a really massive deal in my journey of recovery that I even trust people to be you know, strangers, to be that close to these parts of the body that were so private and I was so ashamed of. This is an image in a mirror. Mirrors are constantly in my working practice as an artist. It's not about vanity. Mirrors have been a terrifying monster in my life. You know, every time I walk past a reflective surface, whether it's a, a glass mirror or a glass door, constantly thinking something's not quite right. That's been with me 25 years. So mirrors are a valuable part in how I'm working with my image in these artworks. And as I said, the camera is a mirror to me. So this work, what's this all about? <laughs> Two years ago, almost to the day, um, I fell down the stairs at home. I got to the bottom of the stairs, I started crying. I didn't really stop crying. I went to bed, I was black and blue, I'd literally come down the stairs um, really fast. I lay in bed and I thought, I just, I just don't feel right, and I'm not sure, I can't really describe it, I just don't feel right. And the next day I got up and I went to work. And I got to my office and I switched my computer on, and I put my hands on the keyboard, and I felt like my body hovered above my hands. And I looked down and I thought, that doesn't feel right, something's not right. And I did emails and the whole morning was really weird and I felt sort of disjointed. I went to the supermarket and I sat in my lunch hour to buy my lunch. And I had a panic attack. I didn't know it was a panic attack. I thought I was having a heart attack. I ended up on the ground. I left the building, I went outside, and I phoned my mum, and I said, I think I just had a heart attack. And she said, if you had a heart attack, I don't think you'd be calling me. What do you mean? <laughs> <laughs> and 
She said, ring the doctor, something's obviously wrong. I went to the doctor the same day. I didn't really stop crying on the way there. Anyway, the doctor prescribed, uh, just sort of, you know, assessed me, and he said, I think you have anxiety, I think you have depression. How long have you been feeling like this? And I thought, 18 months, maybe? I hadn't felt right for 18 months and I just carried on. Because that's what we do, we just carry on. You know, anxiety, we all get a bit anxious, we all get a bit stressed, but this was completely taken me over. I didn't really realise how ill I was until I got to the bottom of the stairs. You know, and I thought I'd lost my footing and I, yeah, you know, it's just an accident. And I was thinking, why would I, what's that about? You know, that doesn't, that feels strange. Anyway, five months followed. I didn't leave the house for five months. And it's the darkest place I've ever been. I, I felt so out of my body. Depression is a really strange experience. And as an adult to go through something, having had all this wonderful recovery and talked about my artwork as I've just done, to suddenly be in this place of real, absolute terror. And I'd like to say it was out of nowhere, but I could feel it creeping on. Creeping, creeping, creeping. Um, five months, I didn't leave the house. And eventually, the UK, the, the kind of health system for treating anxiety disorders was quite slow, so I didn't see a mental health professional for several months. By the time I did, one of the first things I said is, well, I'm an artist, and I do all this work about skin picking, and blah, blah, blah. And she sort of sat there, and she was like, oh, why don't you make some artwork about how you feel now? I can't do that, you know, I'm watching daytime television. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> and she was like, well, when you switch the television off. Why don't you, you know, have a go at making something from it? And it took months. The artwork that came is this artwork. So this is what anxiety and depression felt like for me. The artwork that's here, and obviously it's busy here today, so make sure you go from one end to the other. It starts at that end and comes around to here. And this is the first image in the series. My brain was so full of information and just juddering, juddering, juddering. Suddenly the feeling of compulsive skin picking, which I felt I was dealing with really well and I'd had probably eight years of recovery, suddenly that feeling is in my head. Judder, 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 thoughts, 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 can't switch off, can't switch off. Constantly on alert, constantly anticipating the worst, churning, churning, churning. I felt like I was kind of underwater, so this image is about really disconnecting. Everything was just going on. It was a juddery, frightening place. I couldn't even go to the local shop without having a panic attack. In some respects, I couldn't move from one room to the next without having a panic attack. And panic attacks, when people say, oh, I've got a panic attack, when you have one, it overwhelms you so much. I couldn't breathe. I'd often end up on the floor. I didn't know where I was. It was like coming round from a storm. It's just the most terrifying experience. And for a person that I thought I was, a professional, you know, strong, confident woman, why is this happening to me? My body was making this happen to me. My mind was making this happen to me. Panic attacks for me are like blackened lungs. So physical. It feels really frightening when it's really happening. And eventually, I was just in this blackened place. It was like being in ink all the time. So I ended up making work in my bath. The bath was the only place I felt like I was connected to anything. The warm water was the only thing that made my body feel safe. And during this time, these images happened um, because I'm connected to the Bethlehem Hospital, which is the oldest psychiatric hospital in the world. And that's based in Beckenham, quite near where I live in London. And they have a gallery for mental health, so I've made a connection with them because of all this skin picking and artwork. And they rang me up. They didn't know I was ill. They didn't know I was at home. And Beth, who's the curator, she said to me, um, oh, we'd like you to make some artwork. We've got this festival coming up, and we'd really love you to be involved. And I think it'd be really great for skin picking to be there. And you know, it'd be a great thing. And she, I said, oh, what's the festival? And she said, it's on anxiety. I was like, oh my god, I'm at home with anxiety. <laughs> so I said, oh, I'm really sorry, I've got really bad anxiety. So I'm like, oh, <laughs> really worried about it, I can't do it. And she said, well, maybe maybe this would give you something to make, for, you know, to for you to make the work for. And she said, oh, by the way, we've got funding, so, you know, there's five grand for you to get all the work printed. This is like the dream commission, and I'm in my pajamas watching daytime television. <laughs> 
So I was like, you know, I heard myself say, yeah, I'll do it. And I did do it. And this work was shown in the London Anxiety Festival um, last year. So I was coming through the other side of this really frightening place. And as part of it, um, they said, would you do a performance? You know, you have a performance background. I hadn't performed in like eight years. So at the lowest point in my life, in a place of anxiety, I decided to do a performance about anxiety. So that's what this performance is about. So a bit like here, it's a, a building with a, a big atrium and a long staircase that goes down into a sort of basement. So it's very similar to this medical centre. And it's a centre for mental health in London called the Autus. Um, I know there are some people here today who know about trichotillomania. I haven't suffered from that, but there is this sense that this knotted feeling of anxiety is like I'm pulling my hair out. And I wanted to create something that was a visual representation of that. This is using a huge piece of hair. There were these display tanks in the, um, in the, in the building that I put these big knotted kind of hair balls into. So this is part of the same experience. Writing on the windows of the building, getting this juddering language out of my head. And the display tanks were the perfect metaphor for what it feels like when you have a compulsive disorder that you carry with you everywhere you go. For me, the epitome of kind of placing this illness in a creative place was putting myself in one of the, the display tanks. I feel like I'm on display all the time. We are on display all the time, but when you have a compulsive disorder that is on your skin and it's the first thing people see and it's the first thing you see this flicker go across people's faces if they see a scar, as a skin picker, that is so painful and so difficult. And it's taken me a long time just to accept that look and think, that's fine. I can't do anything about what's on my body now. This is, this is my body now, today. And it ended with me painting my body um, in sort of thick, oily paint at the end, which is what these fine images are about. So, I quit my job. I was a visual art, um, well I was a kind of manager in a dance centre for 10 years and I felt like I was torn in two directions. I had this visual landscape and this visual identity as an artist, but I was a manager and that was my day job and I was there for 10 years going in, doing a huge load of programme management for an arts organisation. I quit the job and from it I have placed this experience centre stage. Everything I do now is about art and everything I do now is about recovery and mental health. Um, I've been able to speak on television, I'm talking about compulsive skin picking. You know, this illness in the UK gets hardly any press at all. I've come to California because you guys are treating it. You have treatment centres specifically for compulsive skin picking. I think I've only met four other people in 20 years who have this illness. But I know there are probably skin pickers standing here, sitting here now. Everyone picks, right? Everyone picks at scabs every now and again. We're humans. But when it becomes a compulsive illness that transforms everything you think about, everything you wear, everything you do, it decides for you whether you can leave the house that day, whether you feel well enough to be seen. You know, that is when it's something to really get help for. So when I've had in invitations to speak, I'm speaking and I'm trying to say, yes, I have this illness and this is an illness I will live with for the rest of my life. That's not something to be ashamed about, that's something to do something with. So, yes to that. <laughs> I met Grayson Perry. Do you know who Grayson Perry is? <gasps> oh, the terrible Californians. <laughs> Grayson Perry is one of the greatest British living artists who has, has expressed that he's lived with mental illness in his life, and art is a big deal for him in terms of processing things you go through. So he is the um, patron of the Bethlehem Hospital. Um, so I met him, and he's he, it's flamboyant. It's <laughs> great. I'm also working in hospices with children. I started teaching young children. I work in a hospice um, for uh, doing art and drama, and I'm using those things that I avoided for so long. Well, not avoided, I just wasn't using them. So my degree in theatre, my degree in dance, they are in my life now. They are not something I think about the weekend. They are centre stage. Messy clay, yes. <laughs> I realised that actually covering myself in paint doesn't mean I can't encourage other people to cover themselves in paint. <laughs> so uh, toddlers, yeah, they are the best audience ever. <laughs> so we do messy clay on Fridays, which as you can see is quite vibrant. <laughs> so this illness has helped me do this. 
I see children who have no inhibitions getting in there and getting messy and having a wonderful time with their bodies, with their skins, right there. It's the biggest healer I can possibly tell you about. We forget that this is where we came from. And actually for me, that journey back to being really visceral and physical and fun, that's what I've had to do on my own, but I can share it with other people. Compulsive. I am incredibly <laughs> compulsive. I won't just do one drawing, I'll do, I don't know how many. I, I think I've filled 21 notebooks in the last couple of months. Mm -hmm. I'm just drawing. I draw on the plane on the way here, I have a notebook in my bag. My fingers need to be busy. You know, in recovery for me, my fingers are the, you know, the primary tool. So if my fingers are drawing and my brain is engaged, I'm not picking. I'm well and I'm doing something creative and it comes out of me and it's, so it's a really valuable thing for me as a person, not just anything else. They're getting bigger, so they're, they're kind of the size of my studio floor at the moment. And this image is really important to me. This is the image of my fingers in the position they would normally be picking in, but they're drawing. So for me, this is a really powerful thing that brings it all together. So my last quote for you. Out of suffering have emerged the strongest souls. The most massive characters are seared with scars. That's it, dudes. <laughs>